Hello, I'm Alex. I'm John. And this is Tech Society Declares Holy War. So I, I, I put it out there. What is privacy? So, oh. um, Dirk, you're you're a legal expert. Well, I, I think the statement whether it was cast legally or not is very insightful because there really is, I think, no reliable permanent definition to the term, and I think mm. we need to allow for a little bit of give here. Maybe one of the starting points is to think of the old uh, sign that used to be you know, up in people's houses, you know, mm. my home is my castle. And um, I think that idea still has some attraction to most. But in a world where we live beyond four walls, that becomes a lot more challenging. Mm. And I think uh, it would be, it's probably useful to define it by some parameters, but it might be premature to look for a sort of rigid permanent definition. Brenda, you're a, um, you, you come at privacy from a more technology and yep. corporate perspective, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you go back to, I think it was about um, 1860 or 1890, uh, there was a judge called uh, Judge Willis that uh, wrote an um, article called Privacy. And uh, he said that the invasion of privacy is evil and it's uh, worth protecting. So even in the 18th uh, century, 1800s, we have um, people realizing that privacy is important, but the actual definition of privacy hasn't been defined. I mean, even if you go to the OAC website, they actually the first paragraph on uh, the definition of privacy is privacy hasn't been defined. It's not even um, defined in the Privacy Act. You could, there's no actually definition in there. Uh, but they do talk about some basics like uh, the control of the type of information you have, um, having that sort of control or um, having that sort of right to control that. And I think that's where you sort of narrow down. But overall, I mean, what your version of privacy and your version of privacy will be different from my version of privacy. Um, but I think at the end, it sort of comes down to the, um, I, and you, you've you got different ver uh, versions. You've got um, data, and then you've got information, and data is your, um, you know, data sets, your variables, or your file names. And then you've got information, which is a whole lot of characters or letters uh, c come together that can identify an individual. Um, and so in, in Australia, what I've noticed is privacy is more focused around the information that can identify an indivi individual. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, I guess the, the abuse of that information, which can lead to the likelihood of harm to an individual. And I guess if you look at that, maybe that sort of starts narrowing down to what privacy is. But it's true, we don't have a definition of it. Well, can I, mm. can I maybe butt in on that? Because mm. uh, the idea that we should all have different ideas of, uh, of privacy in itself is a concern. Mm. So there's, th there are already a couple of things I think uh, we might want to look at. The first one is we have to get to a point where there's a universal understanding of what privacy should be, mm. and mm -hmm. uh, at least some base points. The, um, the other thing is that, you know, we already hear sort of notions, well, if you do this, then it's evil and so forth. And I think the difficulty I have with some of the thinking that comes out of the 19th century is that it's thinking that comes at a time when, and I've often used this, you know, mercury was prescribed as a medical remedy. Um, <laughs> and I think this, the science, that the ex experimentation of how we should live and what rules we should live by was very much underway, and I think a lot of it actually is reasonably rubbish, and I think we can discard. I think that Marxism as a noble idea is fine, but really has no relevance to us now. I think we can stop fearing the owners of the means of production, need to fear the controllers of the means of production. I think Marx hadn't even got his mind around it and hadn't mm. even thought about social democracy. And we've had anything. We've had the anarchists, which I'm starting to think are really the current freedom fighters. i uh, had this debate with somebody on LinkedIn uh, <laughs> yesterday, as a result of which I was called firstly arrogant and then I think three, na three <laughs> Nazi references were made, so I'm so appreciative of all of that. Uh, they came from a high intellectual standpoint. But the, um, uh, the, the difficulty with all of it is that it's the year 2021, we're in a 2021 world, we're supposed to be in a global world, we have no universal global rules, um, we have a number of conventions, we have 
some legal frameworks. We are in an environment where trade is conducted not just across different laws but very different cultures. Uh, people have different ideas of what you should be able to talk about, not talk about, and so forth. Then you have the re-emergence of religious influences, in particular in areas of sexuality, and that would have probably have a significant impact on things like um, pornography and those privacy aspects on the internet and what is and isn't private. Mm. So you've got a convergence of things. And I think that's why probably the, the best thing at this point in time for privacy, in inverted commas, is to start to create some frameworks, put it into the context of who we are, what is the world, and, and then really build a debate about you know where we should end up. Mm. Yeah, so um, yeah, privacy has been part of my life for quite a few decades. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, started in 92, just evolved from there. Um, and what really um, it sparked my interest in privacy more so, especially in the latest um, times, is um, I was listening to YouTube, uh, YouTube music while I was walking down St. George's. And the earphones that I had at the time, and this is where you have the invasion of privacy, the earphones I had at the time were um, broken. And so I had to turn up the volume, like to full volume, um, to actually hear anything. And by the time I'd walked to the end of St. George's Terrace, I got a phone call from a hearing uh, specialist mm. wanting to know if I'd like to book a hearing appointment. And I said, well, why would I want to do that? And they said, no, um, we got some information that you would need um, a hearing appointment. And I thought, where did you get this information from? Um, and I knew immediately right at that exact point, the way the um, I used obviously your YouTube is linked, linked to Gmail and that Gmail account I used I had a different name and they actually addressed me by that last name that I had linked to that YouTube so I knew exactly it came from Google um, and so I felt quite invaded you had somebody uh, making an assumption that I was 90% uh, deaf because <laughs> 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 I needed a, no, a hearing appointment and I think that collection of information, um, it's not only Google, but uh, we have businesses. Um, it's, you know, government is doing their best to create framework, but we're moving at such a warp speed that it's almost difficult for them to sort of keep up and put the frameworks together. But you have uh, corporations that are trying to do their sales. And I think there's a couple of cases that actually cover that, uh, where sales is obviously your bread and butter for most businesses. And of course, information or the people's identities are used as part of their sales because we have to sell something to somebody mm. or to something like a business. And um, and I think there, there, there's, there, I find there's, there's three elements that come down to responsibility. And it doesn't just line on government to come with a framework. I believe there's three of us, there's three things. The first one is government because they help set the framework, but then you also have corporate responsibility, the how they use the type of information they collect, and then you have individual responsibility. It's the, you, the individuals have to be held just as responsible for the amount of information they share. So you've got to have transparency all the way through, um, but at the, at the end, I think if you bring all that, that trifactor together, then you will um, end up having, I guess, a better direction when it comes to privacy. But then it comes back to that point. What is privacy? So what about when a corporation's kind of, uh, I, I won't say breach of privacy, but maybe um, questionable use of privacy mm -hmm. is for a good purpose? Mm -hmm. like, uh, well, so it shouldn't the depend on the purpose. So well, the, the, first, the first one, sorry, just, just mm -hmm. on this point yeah. of the corporation, you know, um, from, from a lawyer's point of view is what is the bargain you have with the internet provider? Who is allowed to, to access what? Yeah. And you will see that it's very much uh, an American law thing to give these corporations what people would often tout as freedom. You know, the f I, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm a company, I need to be free. Uh, I'm going to democratize the economy. And all these concepts are thrown at people and it's very easy to buy into. And I think somebody used the word free dumb instead of free dumb. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's actually a pretty good way of going. Um, I often struggle with the American notions of, of freedom and individual rights and so forth. The way 
And the only way societies can successfully function is if you have rules and you have obligations. And so within that, the individual, I think, has rights, but the individual also has obligations. So mm. in terms of, you know, should you be allowed to start a terrorist organisation and use the internet to hide it? Nope, absolutely not. Um, and that's my, that's my point of view, and always really has been my point of view. So the question then is just bringing it down to how is it that companies can basically uh, dictate to you that the moment you enter through their door, um, things are without a fetter? Mm -hmm. And I'm far more personally worried about what companies do these days than what governments do, because hmm. al although if you start to listen, yeah. if you start to listen to the news, you sort of get this idea that little baby government people are born. You know, sort of in, in, in the hospital, there's a special section, and they're just <laughs> public servants. And it's us and them. Um, and really, I think we're forgetting that government as a body is reasonably transparent, and it should be very transparent. It has its failings. I um, you know, when people attend uh, public hearings and don't produce reports and so they kind of go, well, why are you doing that? And, uh, you know, should, should you actually be doing that? So these are the types of other de debates you have about what government should deliver and how it should be uh, publicly accountable. And there are parts of government that need to be private and espionage and so forth, because I think that's, that's all OK. But I would rather have determination in terms of privacy start at government level than at corporate level because corporates have other problems and that is our Australian government is within our reach. Our High Court will independently scrutinise decisions within the legal framework of the government and so forth. Our High Court really can't do anything against an American company or a British company or a Chinese company, or in particular a Chinese company where there's no reciprocal enforcement. So you're getting into that territory of law, you're getting into that territory of how does the global economy work. Mm. Um, but I think the first thing to do is really to find the the bargain of us all as users entering the internet mm. and what is it we're giving, you know, what contractual rights are we surrendering mm. because that's a very one-sided bargain um, and is that a good thing? And I know I'm arguing uh, for controls, but, but that, uh, by <laughs> doing... for me. But no, no, but actually by, do, by doing that, I just want to stress that I think part of the controls also need to be in controlling the companies. I think yeah. this unfair yeah. reign is toxic. Yeah, and I, and I have to agree on the corporate side. Well, we can't agree, you know that. No, I know, we've got to disagree. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, there's guys, your show is complete. <laughs> there, right now, there, so there, there is that. actually precedence for guests agreeing. Oh, no. And, um, <laughs> yeah, it's you should have rung her in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, with corporation, um, what I found is that you, like your legislation, let's take your, your basic privacy, um, the Privacy Act. Mm -hmm. um, so inside the Privacy Act, besides the uh, different um, uh, chapters inside of that, I think it's chapters, what they have got, they've got your um, uh, principles. You've got 13 principles, which they basically govern how you work with information. And um, once a corporation, now you've got to understand the, the motivating factor for any business is to make money. And we, this, they've yeah. got to make money, make profit. Mm. And the first thing that uh, happens is, of course, they will request information from their customers. Um, and then they take this onus that they own this information. And they can do uh, what, th what they want with this information at their will and pleasure. They can sell it, they can make, um, in fact, I could, you know, the Do Not Call Register, which is tapped into the um, Privacy Act, mm. one of the things is that um, Australian businesses can't make calls to people on the Do Not Call Register within Australia. Well, what they do now is they just take your database, send it over to some other country, and then you go to some other country making calls, and you can make calls at any time you want. Um, and so there's many ways corporations can actually find you've got your, your black, you know, do not do this, and these do these, and then you've got the gray area. And if you find out what the gray area is, you can actually circumvent a lot of the do nots and add to the you can, and then do what you ever want. Because um, if you're pretty smart with, you've got a good legal team, and um, you have... <laughs> <laughs> And, and they can navigate your, um, your company or your corporation or business, however you want an organization, entity, there's a million definitions for that. You can actually navigate it through the uh, legal terrain. And there's, there's, there's nothing you can do. And, and, and a case in point is uh, recently I received a text from a politician. And I'm sure all of you maybe have received this same text. I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I sat there quite perplexed when I got this text. And I was like, you know, um, 
how invasive. You know, you've, mm. sh- you've sent this to me. How did how did you get my telephone number? And I thought for a minute, the te- actual telephone number is actually not listed in the Privacy Act as personal information. It's identified. You can identify. You actually can't. It's just a telephone number. It's just digits. It's a mm. series of digits, and that's it. And they, w- they didn't actually personalize it. They didn't say, uh, dear Brenda. They just... Blasted it blasted out. Blasted it out. Yeah. And I thought, you know, okay, so I can't really use Privacy Act because they didn't really, there's not a, a, a breach of my data of any sort. And I thought, well, how did you get my number? You know, where, where did you get that from? You know, and that got me thinking. I was, okay, well, then it's unauthorized access to some sort of database or some other vendor shared the information and I didn't consent to that, which is part of the elements in your privacy. Uh, individuals got to consent, which is that control. Mm. Um, or... Um, you can also get them under the, under the Spam Act, which is also tied to your Privacy Act. So there's two legislative pieces um, because they just spammed you with information. But the difficulty you have with much of this is that in various fora you might enter as part of the contract, you'll actually give away a lot of your mm-hmm. rights as mm-hmm. to how your information is to be used. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the privacy ideas, the, the wheels fall off because it's usually subject, because it's, it's a personal right. You know, I've, I've been in a medical situation once where um, I, was, I was at a, at a hospital and uh, trying to access one of my forms and the, the lady said, well, I can't give it to you because it's a privacy issue. I'm like, well, that's my right. What, what are you talking to me? You're <laughs> talking about my information here uh, uh, rather than yours. And then, of course, you have the interesting debate about, well, at which point in time does it become their information because you also look at issues like copyright and reducing <laughs> things to, to a certain format and so forth um i stuck with my it's mine it's mine it's mine but that's <laughs> that was a long story i think i think fundamentally the way to maybe approach this into uh into this conversation i'm just putting it out there if, if this is a way forward is i so my, my submission would be that the american idea that you basically leave companies to it and you know because as long as they make profit it's good for the world somehow and um, you don't have any <laughs> controls. That yeah. is um, that that is offensive absurd, to me, and we right? might actually. Yeah. And it is it is it is absurd. It's it, yeah. and you know if you go back and you you have a look at the sort of nineteenth century anarchist idea. I mean, the whole thing is not to have government, and yeah. this is what the communists were dealing with, and and everybody kind of felt that if you remove the fetters of oppression, whatever the oppression is, you know, if it's imperial or by what, if you, if you remove the fetter, then people will somehow find a harmonious. Uh, way of interacting and you know Lenin recognized that straight away when he was at the Finland station they said well look the peasants are revolting and there's a joke I guess <laughs> the, uh, uh, but, but uh, you know and and of course they weren't industrialized and he's like oh we're not ready and then he got on the train reluctantly because the smoke was going up at the St. Peter, uh, St. Petersburg Ballast, uh, St. Petersburg Palace. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Never said English was my first language. Um, and um, the uh, they, they went well. Let's go with a bureaucracy. You know, whilst this sort of peasantry, this this industrial proletariat is bubbling away and maturing, let's just put in some bureaucracy. So even even in that late nineteenth century, early twentieth century thinking, people went whoa. Yeah. Self determination may not actually be that great, and put the brakes on even on the on the most ardent supporters of it in the beginning. And I think we are seeing some anti-government forces. And the problem with that is that we need some form of structure that becomes the gatekeeper and becomes the uh, the rule, the umpire, if you like, of the various forces within society. Because if you leave it to all of us, we'll have war. And um, starting point then is, well, if you, if you remove that, if you can accept the idea that needs to be some form of frame, uh, framework, some form of control, what are the things we need to look at? I mean, in areas of crime, the idea that criminals can ever turn around and say, well, you can't look at that, to me, is repugnant. Now, if you put a criminal lawyer in my chair, they'll have a very different view mm, of life. Correct. I mean, because they'll go, <laughs> oh, you know, you need a warrant for that. Um, <laughs> go, oh, I do. <laughs> no. uh, of course, there is some form of process uh, and so forth. Should, um, should an internet company, for instance, be able to access all your photos? Mm. and determine from your photos that any one of them, in particular through AI, involves a criminal uh, act, in particular if that information is sent to a different Mm. jurisdiction. So this brings us to what Apple has done recently. The reason we're all sitting here talking about this topic was uh, Apple has just declared that the um, iPhones will now um, compare photos on your iPhone with the known child porn database, essentially. That's... um, 
you know, to, to make it really simple. And if it detects that you have child porn on your device, it will report you to the authorities. And it actually checks on the device, right? 1984. Yeah, on the device. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it doesn't send um, it to the service brother. to check. It actually has on the device checking. Yeah. So that's photos. that's rather interesting because I would say that's, um, I mean, you correct uh, me, uh, I would say separation of powers. I mean, because they basically are becoming sort of like an executive arm controlling the, um, the information that's on your device. I mean, they're sort of act, acting as like police. Um, which then they report. I mean, do they have that uh, the, the extent? They, do they have those, that power to start off with? But I do want to talk about crime because you brought up a very interesting point. Um, I, I actually did a, quite a bit. Of, I've been doing a lot of research on the amount of crime, like through dark web, what is the, the, uh, the actual amount of money that crime makes? Mm. Don't know. Because uh, obviously you don't have uh, criminals going, okay, I'm going to uh, fill out my tax return reform now. <laughs> well, isn't, that, isn't that how they got um, uh, the, the you know, original mobster from <laughs> Chicago? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they couldn't but they, it that they, uh, Capone, they couldn't Capone, yeah, thank you. any other crime. Check. It was tax. Yeah, yeah. tax. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Underreported. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course, you got your cryptocurrency. And, you know, most people have this um, belief that a lot of your... Um, uh, addresses are non-public. Yes, you got some cold wallets, but you got uh, a lot of your public-facing wallets, which are easily detectable, so you can actually identify uh, who the individuals are. Well, Bitcoin's and funny, right? Because it's it's pseudonymous. it's anonymous, it's pseudonymous, pseudonymous yeah. but it's yeah. not private at no, all. Correct. It's entirely public. Correct, because yeah. I can actually find quite a lot of people um, on yeah. that because I just need the address. And most one of the th- uh, psychological um, areas of criminals is they've got a very high ego. You know, they think that they are above the law. And so then what happens is you just um, just use Google as a, your um, open source mm. and then you uh, hunt down an address. And I guarantee you it will lead you to some sort of um, Twitter account. And then you know, before you know, <laughs> you've actually found out who the, who the person is. I mean, they're not, uh, that not all of them are extremely smart because they don't have all the skills. So coming down to the crime, it was rather interesting that there was a... Um, uh, a, a individual that talking about the photographs had pictured himself on Facebook um, with drugs mm. and he had his palm up and there was drugs on and he said you know he didn't have any anything else but his hand and what they were able to do was to pick his fingerprints up from the so AI was able to pick up their fingerprints and then from there, they were able to find out where he was, and they arrested him. And I found that um, very interesting because, you know, firstly, I'm going, well, how do you know? I, I, can you conf- is it 100%? Yes, I mean, he's got drugs. I mean, it could have been anybody's hand. How do you know? You know, a whole lot of questions come to my mind from there. But from a, from a criminal perspective, I mean, we've, we have crime will be part of human nature forever. Before the digital era, we used different mediums to commit crime. And now we've got a, a, a different platform that gives the criminals um, what we uh, define as criminals as a person who's bad, which is, according to Marcus Aurelius in his meditation um, book, you know, bad is bad and good is good. Um, and the, the actions that you take are, is what comes at substitute as bad because, you know, bad is what it varies which side of the coin you are. Um, and so the, the criminals are now using this digital platform to do the types of deeds that are coming to the public front. So, you know, your pornography, your child trafficking, your um, even animal drugs, everything. Everything that you find on the dark web is sort of surfacing up. Mm. And um, you've got your um, Apple now stepping in on a personal an uh, uh, individual's personal device, checking through photographs, and you're going, well, actually, do you have a right to do that? You know, well, isn't, isn't, isn't the problem that we're looking, you know, we're, we're already narrowing the issues a little bit too much, I think. We're sort of going, well, Apple did this, and crime, and so forth, and we use very narrow, specific issues. Mm. Um, and there are presumptions within that. What we're lacking in this entire debate is really a modern conversation about what the world should be. And one of, I think, the debates that I find the most sickening is when people start to identify as I'm left or I'm right. Mm. 
Um, because what is the political right? Is it an evangelical Christian right? Is it mm. a, yeah, is, is a, it a national socialist right? Because quite mm. frankly, you're not going to pull off national socialism again because nobody's going to wear the uniforms uh, in daily life. Um, is, it a, um, is it a capitalist right? You know, people, people who are fundamentally laissez-faire and who are as far off autocratic control of anything as possible because they're like, I can do what I like, which I actually think is as I said before, a form of anarchy. Um, you know, I don't want government controlling what I do. So are they the political right? I and mean, then who's the left? You know, is it the mm. less fair left? Because that can't be right, because mm. don't we all have to have a collective will and sort of function as a community? So there's, that is the important conversation. I really think we've come to the point where forget about political notions. I mean, use concepts to try and define what the new one is, but forget the conversations of the 20th century and really start looking at what the future should look like because we have things to do with the environment and all the rest of it. And then you come down to the more nitty gritty. You know, should these corporations suddenly become quasi uh, gatekeepers for anything? And absolutely not. But, 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 but their commercial power is such that they will, as part of being able to access them, uh, retain almost complete control in things. Mm. Then you have further problems with, well, what is a crime? And just when you go to child pornography, for instance, take that um, photo of Ewan McGregor kissing his child. Everybody in Europe went, ah. <laughs> Everybody in America went, pedophile. And um, was he was the child side? naked or like, no? I no, he, he his held his child and he what kissed it on Biden? the lips. But what about Biden stroking the? Well, the that's that's <laughs> well, it's not going to be. No, but this is this is a parent so it's his kissing child. His, his own child. Yeah. Um, I think it was you and, and there was Greg. controversy about this. Have a look really? At that. If you've I didn't. It, um, uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe we can have a um, uh, very capable researcher in yeah, the background. Quick, 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 but you, you, McGregor, had there's a photo that he put up of him kissing his child on the lips. You know, just as you hold your child up, he just kisses the child and put it up going you know this is how much i love my child and in my book that looked reasonably innocent but somebody yeah. sort of looked at it and went well he's going to tongue his kid and that's <laughs> seriously perverse and i thought that was seriously perverse and seriously sickening so yeah, what it seems is like it projection more than Michael, uh, yeah. reality but what is it what is it then that a company with unfettered control over the arena you've entered yep. will then give to whom and where yeah. You know, because if the Norwegian police got it, they're like, oh, well, that's you, McGregor, just being, you know, being a dad. Mm. And if it went into something more fundamentalist somewhere, they'd go, oh, my God, this, you know, set fire to him. Mm. Um, and, um, <laughs> and what happens if you're in one place? and you get pursued in another. Mm. Now, yeah. that's, I mean, that that's one very, well, um, maybe potentially the, poor uh, example, but there's, there's, the, there's actually better examples of that where um, people take photos of their kids in, in bathtubs or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. They, you know, they think it's perfectly innocent and they put it online and then um, they, they get those accusations. Yeah. And actually under some certain uh, countries around the world, they would actually be guilty of Absolutely. distributing yeah. child pornography, like yeah. by the letter of the law. Yeah. But then, but then you um, have a you have a social element coming there. So you, you besides the um, the photograph, and you got corporations now sharing it. You got individuals that shared that photograph mm. of their of their child, and the and then you have the the social element element where people have c come from d uh, different sides, you know, different belief systems. So one is that's terrible. Other one is that's cute. And then you have all the comments underneath that photograph, mm. or almost a trolling almost like a, a bullying element coming through it and then to a point where the person wants to take the photograph down okay. very innocently shared I don't, I don't know why you want to share photographs of your children in the first place but in very, very but innocently shared well, do, yeah. to to do, do, do it at, at first yeah. step it up slightly and go to the modern world where people as a matter of intimacy now exchange photos and let's just say um, 17 year old girl has phoned like 17 year old boy boy sends, uh, sent me a picture she sends the picture um, is she able to contract? Does she have the? Mm. Has she uh, attained the relevant age? Mm. Uh, is she not the author of the picture? So is is that then not a matter of copyright? If she transmitted it, what's the <laughs> license between the two in terms of the transmission? Why would the male then? as a recipient have the right to distribute it is there mm. an imply right uh, and if it's distributed what right would the uh, party affected by that and this sort of slut shaming mm. as it's now called i mean these this type of, it's a crime I and mean, that's it's, it's an offensive if, I mean, if you if you do that you really are you've just 
really hit the bottom of the gene pool. And they've they've, they've <laughs> just made your day worse. Well, it, yeah. it's just, it, no, it, is, it is one of those things that's just so deeply offensive, I yes. think, that's happening. And without repercussions in the, to the largest that's extent. And, yeah. and yeah. more importantly, mm. um, the offender can sit there going, well, that's my phone, I have the privacy rights, you mm. can't enter my private, and you've got to go through a whole lot of hoo-ha to prove whether he disseminated, you know, there, there's preconditions so, sometimes that well, virtually make it impossible to start the search for the information. And so that's so that's should the government be able to access your device? Well, I think that's we had very the interesting, San yeah. Bern- Bernardino, Bernardino yeah. shooting, um, and uh, and the FBI recovered oh, their phone, because, and then because they, yeah. they couldn't get into it, and Apple said, no, we're not going to help you. Well, yeah, that's, because, and, and, and that's Apple basically telling the American government, oh, we're Apple, you're not. Yeah, I know, yeah. it's like Google saying to Australian government, we Google and, yeah. and you're not. But that's very interesting about the phone because the question is, what did you buy? So you bought property, tangible property, which is a phone, right? And inside of that phone, you have digital content. So you don't actually own those apps. Mm. You lease those apps that you download, they give you free access. So the question is, if you've got somebody that shared um, an image, and you brought a really good point up about copyright. I mean, All I my points are excellent. Thank I know. <laughs> and like the copyright, I mean, when the, if, if the person took a selfie, you know, then they own the content because they used yeah. the phone to take it. But um, they've, they've shared that content. Technically, the only thing that that person has control of, has rights on, is the actual physical device. They don't own the apps. They've got the rights to use them. Um, they may maybe take photographs. They have the rights to those photographs because they're the authors of those photographs, um, mm. following on your author co- copyright point. Um, but the question is, can, and when we've seen this, we've seen some changes in uh, some amendments and new bills coming where um, there, there's a bill that's been presented and it's, there's a lot of hoo-ha on, online at the moment with the Australian government able mm. to actual social media accounts and a- able to change things. You know, can they... Can, is, is that invasive? I mean, the question is, where do you draw the line? And do they as- assume, do they, do they have to go through a whole, yes, we, we agree, this person, uh, John John, is a, is a um, criminal and we can access it and we can change things and change addresses. I mean, where do we put draw the line? I mean, do they have a, a framework for that? I mean, is that invading somebody's privacy? So I think with the current bill, they, mm. there is no check on that power. They don't have to take it before a judge. Mm, correct. They can just justify why they're doing it. Correct. And, um, Which and is yeah, makes it pretty can, scary because in, yeah. d- wouldn't you say that that's a bit of a judicial arm? So you've got uh, executors, which is the they um, making and ensure that the um, law has been enforced, and then they're making a, a judge judgment uh, on behalf of the judicial side. So now we are now going to um, access this. So I would say that the separation of powers it is a bit of um, conflict. There's a bit of overlap over there. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm be interested because it's a bill right now. So I'm, I'm interested to see how far up the channel that one will go. Take take a, just another example. So if we, there are cultures in this world where people still legally marry very young. Yeah. And mm-hmm. certainly at an age that would be illegal in many of the jurisdictions we would sort of... Uh, be in and so let's say you put the wedding photo up and go you know here is little x and you know at the age of 14 he's finally marrying his promised bride y um and she's 12. in fact there was a documentary the other day Mm. i watched on this going hang on am i seeing this because um they seem like really young by any standard so um you know at which point in time do do you go in and this this again is one of those difficulties where you have different standards i mean yeah. the scandinavians for instance are very comfortable with nudity uh, whereas the well known thing of american tv you know you can blow anything to anything and uh, um, but you can't show the nudity you know that's yeah, still torture's a, fine but a, sex a is not yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. sex <laughs> isn't and so of course that breeds its own uh, its its own dynamics and its own uh, difficulties but um The conversation needs to be had, I think, looking at all specific areas Mm. and saying, well, what is it we want to protect? Because we're instinctively drawn to a notion of privacy. We're also instinctively drawn to a a notion of what is a wrong. But we need to find a language that goes beyond, I think, the narrow boundaries um, and, and really say, well, what is the point of doing this in Australia when, as you say, you know, you can give a database to another place and mm. all the laws are circumvented or uh, suddenly you're in trouble in another mm. place when you thought you're OK here. And how is that a thing that uh, because trade is now global? How is it a thing that we can have this fragmentation? I've, I find that very disturbing. I think that's mm. the first serious conversation the world needs to have 
We've managed to have a, a human rights <coughs> charter, and it's probably time to really talk about, well, mm. what are some of the things you should be able to protect? Um, take medical information now, moving slightly away from, from crime and so forth. Um, clearly, what is medical, to mm. me, I, I would sensitive have thought would be, yep. would, would be reasonably sensitive. However, mm. we also live in the age of COVID. So mm. is it a matter of public health mm. that if you are diagnosed with a disease that is communicable and of a public health issue, mm. then at least a certain number of people, you know, you catch Ebola. Um, but, 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 that, but, that, but that element will only be is only uh, valid because it's uh, been under your constitution section uh, 51 has um, pandemic. And so because it's been declared as a pandemic, you think we can actually create law underneath that. But if there wasn't a pandemic, I mean, do we tell you know, everybody that you've got COVID or do you have flu or do you have... Well, it's, mm. it's, it's already enshrined in human rights too, yeah. that matters of public order, which would include matters relating to public health yeah. to some extent. That's why the, the Human Rights Commission here currently is okay with what's happening the degree is, is sort of okay with what's happening on the COVID side of things. You know, a lot of people are going, oh, my human rights, my human rights. I mean, when people introduced seatbelts, mm. uh, that was seen as a fetter on human rights. I think it's still Americans that believe that, right? Well, uh, absolutely. I think and that, you just look at like that. like 50% thing. of uh, road... I, 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 I pulled that stat completely out of my ass, but I think it's, <laughs> it's roughly there that uh, 50% of road accident deaths in the United States are because they weren't wearing their seatbelt. Mm. Which, you know, as an Australian, is fucking insane because yeah. um as, as a small child I put my seatbelt on and and I, it's like it's, well it's, it's just basics physics right if a vehicle's moving at 120 k's an hour you you're moving also at the same speed and if you're going to come to complete stop mm. there's going to be an action reaction point there don't you think I mean, it's also yeah. it's also yeah. the thing that kills the princess diana conspiracy because what if she'd fastened her seatbelt <laughs> yeah and how would any of yeah. the arguments about speed and so you know, <laughs> her being, having been in one of the safest cars in the world otherwise uh, yeah. fast you know buckle up yeah. but people are obsessed with this thing and i think that it really comes from a place of selfish ignorance i i, I just find it not within me to credit this sort of well I don't have to wear my seatbelt because how does life work you know how do our actions affect other people mm. so this is um, freedom of speech right so no that's freedom in all areas so, so I'll give you, I'll give you another have freedom of speech. no we don't but there's a lot well, of Australians we, we, who think we, we, we do but right? we do but we don't need a constitutional. I actually yeah. think we're freer to speak they here than many people. Of, yeah, implied, you know, implied freedom of speech. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and I think generally by our social standards, unless you do something, we don't have to express it to say you have the right. We have <coughs> things that say, well, this is when we can take it away. Yeah. Mm. And so, uh, you know, we don't have a prohibition of freedom of speech. This is where the American idea of this constitution, well, we have this constitution. I think it's one of the worst documents, and that's why it's amended every five <laughs> which, minutes. Which was uh, the, uh, the, uh, their, their one or our one? No, ours is great. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> go Australia. <laughs> yeah. uh, but because um, ours, um, ours is copied on theirs. I mean, they we went over there and sort of like, what are you guys doing? Oh, that sounds pretty good. We'll just uh, amend ours yeah. a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Hey, we. <laughs> no, I, I think I, I don't know if ours is really quite. That I think ours is. Uh, I'd really like to sort of preserve our British influences a little bit more than uh, notions of of, of 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 you know free trade, notions of all of that. They're they're things that were just part of the exchange between the countries that were doing it at the time. But I think the inherent sensitivity as to justice really is British model, not American model. That's how I look at, at, at the way we do things, and I'm pretty happy with that, in particular working with English law, which I think is, is a good body. But let, let me just take you to another example. Maybe we can have a quick chat about this. Naomi Campbell, mm. some time ago, was yes. photographed coming yes. out of her right doctor's this. appointment. Mm. Mm. And the media said, freedom, freedom, freedom. I, you know, the public has a right to know. Well, this is another one of those idiotic <laughs> arguments, which is to know what what yeah. uh, Mr. Jones or Mrs. Jones needs mm. to sit in their armchair or his armchair yeah. um, or non-binary armchair and, uh, uh, and work out uh, whether or not Naomi Campbell has been there. So we break it down. She's mm. gone to the doctor. That's, that has to be private. Um, mm. She's a public figure. Okay, there's an element of public. She wasn't inside, so mm. that's no longer... Um, private, but the fact that she was on private business, that is private. Mm. And, you know, these are these are discussions we need to have. Mm. What about the, the internet then? Like, is that, yeah, is that so public or is that private? Well, you know I, mean, I mean, it depends, depends which side of the fence you're sitting. But mm. um, we, we, we are from a privacy perspective, I think we started the discussion of uh, framework. Your GDPR was um, definitely the starting point of that. They've created some good frameworks. So I mean, it seems like elements. the EU is the only one who actually cares about 
supremacy, right? Yeah, like, no, that's no, I'm, my I'm actually, um, you know, the one of the th one of the things I haven't seen happen in Australians, uh, it only started happening late last year, is that you have a, a legislative piece, but you don't actually have any action. We've got a toothless tiger running around uh, saying, don't do this and don't do that, but don't worry, we're not going to do anything about it. Whereas EU goes, look, we're pretty serious. Are we going to do this? We're going to fine you. Mm. Oh, yeah, you've been fined. And but, and uh, well, isn't it uh, isn't our government a bit two faced about privacy? Where on the one hand, you know, they've got the Privacy <laughs> Act and they're supporting that and they amend and that, and then on the other hand, they are hoovering up all our data. Yes, data sharing. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So and and changing the would would, uh, would would does that does that undermine the trust in that institution well, to protect think, our privacy in the, the first place? The rationalisation for the division is that uh, there is that that sort of identifiable, you know, mm. you as you mm. data, and mm. then there is the data about you but people can't really work out it's you unless people go well mm. you know, context if, if yeah. you're the yeah. only case to have yeah. a, a rare new yeah. disease yeah. and you got bitten by a lemur in the <coughs> zoo and you have to be like patient zero you know and people go we're not mentioning names but it's so it's, you know, it's, it's all traceable back because part of unma uh, part of masking data of course is that you know if you have a community of 100 people and there's five people over the age of 50 and you go well five people in the community or so and so have the five, you, know, mm. you, you you can work out who it is you yeah. can actually yeah. reverse engineer so it's identifiable that 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 key element yeah is whether you and this is when i when i work with businesses quite a lot in regards to the private sector uh, they ask the question and go you know it, what should we do and i said can you identify an individual mm. and i said like for instance postal code can i just use a postal code i said yes you can but let's go well what's a but as it is, a postal code is uh, leads to a town where there's only one person that <laughs> lives there. <laughs> <laughs> then you can identify that person in that postal code. Yeah. So if you use, let's say, 6,000, you've got quite a few million people. Well, is it quite a few million living in Perth? Maybe In the CBD. Oh, a couple, yeah. couple I think. of million, I think, all up, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So you've got quite a few. Yeah. So, you know, if you just use 6,000, it's like, you know, can't identify an individual because there's quite a few of them hmm. in Perth. But as soon as you start adding context, 6,000... Uh, brown hair, glasses, wears a blue jacket, um, uh, he's currently speaking on podcasts. You know, you start adding all those contests. It's probably a few thousand of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and, you start, and you start colouring it, yeah, start colouring the picture. Yeah. Then you start identifying the individual. And it's it's all those um, those elements that you start adding together mm. um, to identify an individual. And that's where the problem is, is that we have businesses that have collected a lot of information about individuals. In fact, they've collected a lot of data. You have um, all sorts of tools that you can use to collect this data. You've got cookies, websites that just uh, uh, can get all your information. You've got pixels, which they can embed into your market materials, websites, and things like mm -hmm. that. And you've got all these uh, little um, tools that they can use, which is your gray zone to collect uh, information about customers or what their preference are, you know, they like blue or pink. Well, now everyone's using Google's browser as well, which correct. Like, yeah, and should that be illegal? Right? Yeah, correct. Because that, that, that's exactly what we what us. we're talking about. And yeah. where does the frame yeah. where does that framework work? The because technology exists, but it should it be used? And and the government's so far behind it, and they seem more they seem more focused on them getting our data <laughs> than, uh, than stopping the well, corporations from abusing that it's ability. It's usually right? to um, protect us from terrorists, apparently. So. And, and, and child pornographers. Yeah, well, and, 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 and cyber criminals. And but, 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 of yeah. but of course, the, the other problem in that is too, that you know, you, you sort of have these, uh, the crime du jour, you know, mm. where they go, that's the crime of the day, we're going to pursue that one. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have a huge number of problems, for instance, with white slavery, yeah. uh, people who are even working in businesses in, in WA in Perth now, who are maybe illegal, who have uh, no protections, mm. uh, workplace-wise, who yep. are working under shocking conditions, mm. and we've had a couple of quite spectacular cases in the news. Should these people be allowed to to again use an instrument where they could be found, where they could be tracked, and we don't do it. You know, is, is it the social responsibility towards uh, the victim? And, and by using social responsibility, I've actually used a European phrase. The Americans are all about the rights of the individual and you can't tell me what to do. Mm. The Europeans have this approach of, well, what's the social responsibility? The Europeans also have and it's often put in the context of Nazism, but the, f the more shocking, um, more, uh, you know, real in the sense that it just happened recently experience was that of the uh, the Iron Curtain. Now, East Germany, where one 
in three adults spied on the other. And not spy in the sense of, well, I don't like what they're wearing, but they look suspect and people will drag you out of bed in the middle of the night and just interview you for, for a few days to see mm. if you're um, planning to overthrow Eric Honecker. Yeah, um, and World War Two. We just, uh, you know, go back to 1930s. We had that sort of, we could have learned a lot uh, from Hitler. <laughs> but the technology back then was not sophisticated enough to hoover up the data as it is today. Mm. Well, they yeah, used, no, they, they they used pen and pencil, and, and mind you, but there's the other problem now with COVID, that out of this, this, this culture of herd um, comes uh, another problem, and that is when COVID actually happened, the Germans were all using faxes and pens and paper and so they weren't able to to trace cases fast enough hmm. because everybody were oh privacy privacy um and they were you know doing things manually mm. by hand and the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing mm. and so they had, had unnecessary outbreaks which with some technology they could have fixed so their increased privacy had a chilling effect well, it, 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 privacy it or technological level of using well, old I mean, tech because I want to I want to kind of roll this into Safe WA. I was going to go there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. because that's rather interesting. You know, when they brought Is out that, that app, oppression? yeah, when they brought out <laughs> when they brought out that the the app, the Safe WA app. Um, before they they had, we were talking about it, mm. and I said oh, I, was, I was wondering if I can actually download this code. So I did a little bit of investigation to find out where the basis of this code comes from. Yeah, and I was able to download seventy five percent of that code from GitHub. Yes, interesting. And, I believe and there's a Singaporean company. Yes, yes, that's yep. right. So I've got that mm -hmm. code, and I'm and I'm thinking like, uh, so if you if you played on GitHub, which I'm sure you guys have, of course, yeah, you can actually download code and you can make some alterations and then you can upload the code. And um, before that, there was an element in GitHub that actually didn't check. Did they, it's only then you brought that out in the things last eighteen months, where they started. Um, you know. They would uh, scan through and start checking code. And then I thought, well, you only take one, it just takes one line to mm. actually uh, create, you don't, you know, look at your Morris worm. It was what, 100 and something kilobytes, like 116 kilobytes, it wasn't all that, that big. And it caused this, caused this massive problem. Um, and it was raised, that concern was raised. And then what happened was they actually did find a vulnerability, which they had to fix, and they had to do all those things. I don't know if you remember going back in July, August, they had all these things coming, uh, coming out, and then I had to do all these patching as as they were going along. But then what happened was the police That's used, right. yeah, and the latest data, yes, to catch criminals. Now is that, is that, and is the, the question is, what is that word criminal? I mean, uh, just because I call you a criminal, are you really a criminal? What what did I, what did I get you well, for? Well, I, I mm. you know you. you and, and this is the basic premise of what, what do we define as crime? And then within that definition of crime, mm. um, how do we go about the process of establishing that a person is actually guilty? And then mm. you have this idea, of course, that's very much the, the backbone of English criminal law that you are innocent until proven guilty. And mm. so with that is so when people go, well, and, and, you know, obviously I'm running that side of the argument, but criminals should not hide on the internet. I mean, you're not technically a criminal until. However, uh, as nefarious activities are then discoverable, um, the process of collecting the evidence, you know, should that be made easier? The criminal lawyers would generally argue, well, no, 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 that's you know, it's one standard of it Makes of their jobs harder. But <laughs> what if the internet's just done nothing but supercharge the um, the commission of crime mm. and mm. what is the function of government in terms of the protection of the victim you know how many times I mean what if Apple picking up a picture could have present could have uh, helped you know a child somewhere that's kept under horrible conditions but at the same flip they could also c convict somebody of a possible uh, crime that they never well and, and, and deep, that's you my fake Ma now that, well, but that's my Ewan McGregor point yeah. as well and that's well now you get to another thing which is the deep fake um, <laughs> but let's take the deep fake so I don't know how the technology works you're probably much more across it but let's say you claim it's deep fake but the evidence you need is someone they go oh privacy I'm sorry we're not going to give you that information and mm. they're in a jurisdiction where you're not going to get a court order uh, to release the information, you know, how do you how do you then deal with that? Should there actually be an international standard by which, well, this is a matter that's relevant mm. to a process of the law. Therefore, this company that has this source information is required to hand that over, and that's why I think we need to start at the top of the debate and work our way down and continuously test the idea and test the assumption by referring it back to specific examples, because mm. as we see here, we're actually not as much at odds 
but we're agreeing a lot. But we're Sorry. also no, no, um, no but I, I think it really comes down to the fact that ultimately reasonable people, you know, good barristers will always argue on very narrow points. It's actually the yeah. terrible lawyers that argue everything. Um, uh, you know, the, the good barristers in the, in the really difficult trials tend to be able to identify issues, narrow a lot of it down, and then mm. go boom. So there, there's no there's no wrong in that process either. Um, I'm always concerned when I hear people throw a phrase like freedom or privacy, park it there, and it becomes, as somebody put it to me, an inalienable right. Mm. It's like, mm. really? It's, it's that? What you've, we've just cast that in concrete? And that is a very, very dangerous approach. Yeah, I, think, I think APP6 is a big one. APP6 is talking about the disclosure and, uh, sorry, Australian privacy principles for APP. Mm-hmm. Um, and six is the, the use and disclosure of information. So I think, uh, I think the, the baseline for everything is how people, how governments, how co- corporations, how individuals use and disclose another individual's uh, information. And I think that that would form probably a baseline for everything because, I mean, from, uh, from Apple... I mean, did I consent to them um, firstly accessing my information mm. and using it without my, cons- my consent? Because I've, I've signed an agreement with them that, that I'm going to use their um, services to store my photographs. And inside of that original agreement, I never consented them f- to them accessing the information. Well, actually, that's well, why you, they've, you, they've programmed it to do it on your phone. So mm. they're, they're not actually doing it in their yeah. cloud and environment. And I think the consent thing yeah. is quite interesting because the average person just Doesn't consents, even read it, right? consents yeah. to everything. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, when no, you get well, the border, you get the border, it says, you have all my information, I just want to go home now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but, yeah. If, yeah. but if you want to watch a streaming channel or a, uh, a podcast or something, you need the streaming uh, platform to as, as access, do you really sit there and you know, the movie starts in two minutes or whatever you want to listen to, you want to have now, do you sit there and, and have a proper analysis of not only what the terms and conditions yeah. say, but mm. how that w- would actually affect you if it's a fair term mm. within our local law and yep. this and that, be- be- because you're not going to get legal advice. And this is, I think, where government intervention and creating wider rules is actually vital because the idea of leaving it to the individual to negotiate their bargain is just nonsense. Mm. It's too complicated. You know, people now have in franchising, for instance, these lovely disclosure documents on when you buy a franchise. And the thing is bigger than most franchise agreements. Yeah. You know, you, you, it's usually sort of a, a brain breaker to try and decipher all the bits you need to think about and what they could mean and investigate it and so forth. So, um, yes, it's great for people to have that level of transparency, but it's also pointless. Mm. And I think if we could create maybe in the form of, the, say, the, the Human Rights Charter, which, again, was very se- post-Second World War, the Americans went, well, we run the world. Guys around the table, do you agree? <laughs> Stalin's like, I don't care because it's not going to affect me. Um, <laughs> because you're not going to come into my country. Because I said rules. Yeah, well, you're not going to come into my country and check me because I'll, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I say gulag and you think. Um, <laughs> the, um, Good luck. Uh, exactly. And, uh, you know, but, but now, for instance, even with the, with the power in the world, well, uh, we're still looking at the world through our Australian eyes in this context of the mm. thing. What if the yeah. Chinese were to develop a universal standard for the world about how to, using their view of how things should be run. I think uh, the Chinese don't have any kind of expectation of privacy at all, well, right? Even if they did, uh, the countries would rarely agree with each other anyway. Yeah, but they did uh, recently just amend, the chi- China did amend their privacy uh, legislation piece. I mean, which is a bit of ironic, but um, I'd, I'd, it just popped up um, one of my searches and I didn't actually have time to go through it. Um, but that's a good point that you brought up about, about China. I mean, uh, it comes down to perception, really. And we perceive privacy um, that in, in some cases, you know, government should have access to our personal information. Corporations shouldn't have a- access to our personal information. We should have that, con- that sort of control. <clears throat> Ironically, uh, the Privacy Act, which is more about protection of information than uh, your rights to the use of the information, although that's covered in your APPs, um, the the individuals, all of us, should have some sort of right to how you have access to information mm. and how you use it. Um, but and that's what we understand in in Australia. But in in China, you know, if we don't share all and do all then we're probably going to be devalued on mm. the social scale mm. and probably won't have a job by the end of the day. Yep. And so um, it, it's, it's, if you took a fence line 
the perception on that side is give all, mm. otherwise there's hell to pay. And on our side is no, we've got to protect some things. The question is, what are we protecting? So then uh, that comes back to the first introduction. What is privacy? What is privacy to you? Why does it? Why does it? Why does it matter to you? And, you know, and then you tie that into. Okay, so we'll, if we take the Privacy Act, which defines your personal information, which is very vague because it doesn't really set definitions, like it's your first name, it's your last name, because that's under the identity. And then, um, and then it goes into your sense information, then, then it describes your, your biometric information, your, um, uh, your religious beliefs. Uh, whether your your gender, your transgender, your sexuality, your sexual uh, orientation, and that's, that stipulates things. But from the personal information, it's really difficult. So therefore, it, it it still leaves every person, company, and even government a little bit confused to what is privacy. Uh, but it all comes down to the if you reverse engineer it, you go all the way to the end. Why are we protecting this privacy? Why, what what is it? And it comes down to the um, the likelihood of harm on an individual. Mm. And what does that look like? So the likelihood of harm is could be like identity theft. So last year, if you go to Scamwatch, it was um, you know the Scamwatch.com.au or org.au. I don't know the uh, last uh, prefixes. There was three million um, reported identity thefts. Now identity thefts come from data breaches. Data breaches come from uh, corporations gathering all this information and then uh, decided to take the cheap way out and not put the protection around the information. So mm. for many years, they would keep things in text files. They wouldn't even, like, like for instance, uh, Marriott Hotel. SHA-1, mm. the SHA-1 encryption, which is like, you can just, uh, yeah, it's, it's kindergarten, yeah. in kin kin a, a, a year one can actually decrypt that. And they kept all this information, uh, which is basically text format for and uh, credit card details, first name, where they stayed, how long they stayed, the, the dogs, a name, the type of dog, yeah, everything. And um, and so then you've got to, you, the, the harm element. So you've got the, the data breach. You've got people have now got access it because it's easy. I mean, let's look at it. You're walking down St. George's Terrace. You've got the door open, and it says uh, free lunch, help yourself to anything. Because basically that's what it is. I mean, we didn't really set parameters to lock those doors. And, um, and so that last year we had 3 million identity thefts. This year, we haven't even finished this year. Guess how much we've got now? How many? Five million. So we oh. almost double. I would say that I, I would be brave to predict. We are in, what, we're in September. So chances of another million. We've almost doubled from last year from identity thefts. And so that's the likelihood of harm. The harm is the person uh, getting all this information, uh, be able to identify the individual. Yeah, your name is Max. Last name is Smith. I know where you live. I've got your passport details. I've got your driver's license, because companies are failing to protect the information, and um, they they store it in in uh, ridiculous places on your computer with no locks on it. People walk around with their um, business computers, and I've got like like UWA. Mm. UWA had a whole lot of students' uh, details on computers. Twenty five computers were stolen, with um, passports, driver's license, um, everybody's uh, identifiables on there. And um, they got, they didn't even, they got, oh, just don't do that again. There are no fines, no nothing, no support on those individuals. To get a person's, um, I was talking to somebody recently, to get a person's identity back will cost an individual $25,000. No, and there's no, no and there's well, you're, and you're not going to get. I mean, realistically, you're not going, you're not going to, get to get it back. back. No, and no. and the other things do. What does what does the protection of your identity actually mean in the internet? Because most I'll, of I'll, us, yeah, cause I know because you talk about the Privacy Act, I yeah. and all that. The internet doesn't actually care. Mm. So, no, it so doesn't. all your regulations mm. in Australia doesn't actually make a difference. No. So my concern here is that you can regulate as hard as you can. Companies overseas just. Don't give a shit. So yeah. that has yeah. to be fixed, though, and and it really the time has come to fix that. Because how do you? But fix is it late to fix it? Because we got like what? How many last year? A uh, couple of billion was. F was it, how how many billion that was uh, data data um, t uh, sets that were stolen? Does and the breaches happen 
all the damn time. So, yes. Um, mm. And the problem, we've, we've talked about this on the podcast before, is that it's pretty much out there already. Yes. And yeah. the people that haven't had their identity stolen, it's just a matter of time before it is. Well, yeah, and, is, and so but maybe we'd be yeah. protecting our future generation. We should be setting rules. Well, of course we need to protect, because, because yeah. many generations at various points in history will suffer ridiculous positions, whether it's a ridiculous war mm. or ridiculous injustices. And the point of the human condition is you move beyond that and like you evolve cannot. positively. Well, we don't want to have that uh, sort I, of My concern right is here. that you <laughs> cannot protect against just blasting shit on the internet because well, the, the first the first well, because that's, the US, but that's uh, individual responsibility well, it does it rely on the, well, it relies on all the yeah. places that we can't reach coming to a consensus and it relies on those places to say in the case of the US all right we'll change our mind on how we think you should be allowed to live and mm. those places that generally have another standard to the US which would also hurt us to say okay we understand how you want to live we we're fighting on so many fronts at the moment because of the specific issues you know diversity is diversity actually desirable well I, I put up a LinkedIn post and I thought people would furiously respond to it because <coughs> I put in two remarks from two people about diversity none of which were complementary to diversity but one <laughs> was an, a Republican staunch you know traditional American hard right Republican and the other one was a post-Marxist German who started um, the Frank well, was part of the Frankfurt School and probably gave rise to all the Black Lives Matter movements. But they actually had an, a, an intersection where it looks like they've met. And each brought a different, <coughs> you know, one sort Sorry. of said, well, diversity, why do I need diversity? We're all Americans. And the other said, well, diversity is a tool by which you can again start to, to oppress and then advance the theory on there. We're so busy now dealing with narrow concepts. We, we stopped slotting things into a bigger picture. You know, the, the, the late 19th century, early 20th century person was confronted with, oh, my God, a thousand years of how we used to do things, the feudal, the feudal, agricultural subsistence farmer type way is stopping with it comes the end of the paternalistic society so some of the protections that were built into that cruelty are falling away these industries are giving no protection how do we live and so some went we want to be free some said no no we want to be part of a collective and so forth they had that and then we've stopped doing it and yet in terms of social evolution <laughs> we've just gone rocket speed you know into mm. space and we've got ahead of ourselves, and now we're stopping at points. You know, do, would anybody disagree that you know you shouldn't be tolerant? Of course, you need to be tolerant because that's how it works. Does tolerance then give rise to parallel worlds where every pocket does their own thing, and in a sense, you create sort of hate within that? And what does it mean in terms of law? What does it mean by people saying, "Well, I'm not going to belong to this part of the same tribe"? because I am in my parallel world. You can't tell me what to do. I have a freedom to practice my religion and my beliefs are inconsistent with that. Or, or, or can we um, compare this to the people protesting uh, lockdown, right? But Where our, our society has decided that that's, the, that's the, the right thing to do to protect our society. And people uh, are, are, are saying that um, you know, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's a breach of their rights. And then if we go back to the COVID safe app that um, that kind of tracking is also a violation of people's rights. But so isn't, isn't it this, you, you have a virus that some years ago was contained. You had the early SARS, you know, it looked a bit bad in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was all over it like a rash. They contained it. They had illness. They had disease. The world went, we don't want this. So the Americans started developing vaccines. The CDC was in place. We're going to nip this in the bud. Then we plot on and uh, yeah, okay, it doesn't look like anything dangerous is going to happen. We stop funding the research. Uh, don't worry about a vaccine for this. It's not going to happen. Then it happens. Mm. And then people sit there and go, oh, well, it wasn't really a problem first time around because we all panicked. <laughs> and I tell you what, let's just let these planes go in and these people wander. And, uh, you know, Ishko, the, um, the the snow resort in, in Austria, became a major outbreak centre because everybody went, don't care what you have to say, party, party. And they were going, um, 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 and, you know, <laughs> suddenly you had a, a massive outbreak in the middle of Europe and so forth. At that point in time, where the virus was, what were you going to do to stop it? Lockdown was the only thing to do. Mm -hmm. And the word quarantine, 40 days, was used by the Venetian to keep their island safe. And hey, you know, they've, the Venetians lasted for a while. So it's been a tested formula. People without any scientific knowledge when I don't know what this is, but I'm going to build a wall around my stuff because I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. We went the other way. Why? Because we did the freedom thing. And suddenly as a community, 
we allow people to say, well, my own individual will overrides the interests of the others, overrides it to their detriment, because that individual then doesn't answer to the damage they cause. But I don't think it's, I don't think, because you talked about the app, right? And Mm. you talked about the collection of information. I don't think it's the... um, the sharing of information or the collection of information that people are concerned about. It's more so of uh, the powers to be that ha- that gather that information, what they're going to do with that information. And we had a really a good case with the police um, using that information to mm. arrest people. Yeah, yeah. So that doesn't instill confidence uh, because they, they came out, the, they being the government, came out in uh, June and July and said, we've got this app. We only, and they created all these strict rules. Uh, the strict rules is uh, businesses are going to keep that information if they got it on pen and paper for 28 days, and then after that they've got to destroy it. Mm. Um, and they said they will keep this information, which is interesting because you know how long, how it, how, lo- how how long is the incubation period of the, of the virus? We still still don't know because we got lockdown going on for weeks, and it's it, there's still stuff we still don't know enough. About uh, well, what's we've, going on. S- we've stopped looking at things because we're all busy arguing over whether or not we should have a lockdown. Well, I, well, sorry, I, I, I don't want to interrupt you, say, but yeah. because I was still trying to make this point about lockdown. You know, we, <laughs> we got to a point <laughs> on policy without letting it mature. You know, nobody goes, it's the old Sun Tzu thing. You know, you, you've got tactics, you've got strategy, and you get that mix right, and you're on a really bad road. The idea that you stand back and do that, this this is what mm. I'm saying. I mean, you're saying now specifically look at what's happened moving forward to the app and, and, and its misuses. Then, of course, you have the other problem of whether or not information that was obtained outside the parameters yes. of that mm. can actually lead to a conviction. So forget the prosecution. Would it lead to a successful conviction? Yep. Because the basis might be that the evidence was not properly obtained. Yep. And and then, because yes, the police it, knocked on your door, but you're not going to go. To yeah, cor- uh, correct. But the the thing is, it comes down to the confidence within uh, society. We've got a... Mm. We've, 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 we've got the story come through um the government have or the police have used it maybe outside of the bounds of what they're allowed to they've they created all these strict rules about um what they're going to do with the with the app it's going to be kept for 28 days we're not going to use it to locate you to use it to tap into the geolocation um it will uh, and then they gave us this long story and then at the end and we were well, now all convinced okay we believe you, government. You, we we know that you're never going to use this information. That you've set the bra- the f- the framework. This is how we're going to use it. And then you find that the police have used it mm. to uh, arrest criminals. I mean, the, now everyone's like, oh, they now 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 we've just created not only dis- uh, distrust and uh, we now don't uh, lack of confidence in in the system. We've also now got uh, paranoia <laughs> surfacing, and any uh, type of person that's got any uh, question about. Um, the, the government not doing the right thing. It, they've they now superseded that. They've just add, added that paranoia on steroids, and and they won't go near. They won't even. They won't go use the app to start off with, and they won't uh, you download it. And they probably won't even fill out their names now on mm. on any other forms, because um, the government who said who set the the framework we are going to use it for this and this is how we do it. They broke their rules, and it comes down to. The use of that information, the access of that information, who's, who's going to have access to it, the security of that information that you have, which is your APP11. Um, and then, of course, you've got uh, you, this society, which you've just turned up uh, the heat a bit because you've got lockdown happening, your business is closing, you know, you've got to wear masks. We're lucky we're not wearing yeah, masks. Yeah, I mean, we are um, so... We're, we're the last place lucky. on earth to, yeah, to live pretty much. where we are. So yeah. 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 And so uh, we're living abnormally compared to everyone else. Absolutely. But, yeah. but, but um, you have all this, this um, uh, pent-up fear happening. Um, and then, of course, you're the app. I mean, I, I can un- you can understand why people are, d- are looking at the government going, we don't trust you with our information. Well, so, um, <laughs> let's just do final statements so, like, really yeah. quickly on, pr- on privacy. Um, yeah. My point in in the beginning was the wider context, and I yeah. think all these things relate to it because if mm. you do it from the detail up, you're going to get it wrong. Yeah. It's got to it's got to have an overarching purpose, and people have to have this robust exchange because yeah. I respect your views on the erosion of the community by these standards, and I hope you heard my views Absolutely. and where I come from, and mm. we might disagree, but that is what our democracy is, and that is the stuff together with technical experience that should peel back 
the, the answer to how we live with our digital world, how we engage with the agencies that look after us, and that should shape a fundamentally broad, um, you know, reconcilable approach to privacy as well. I think that um, I'll go back to my little five cents worth is um, all of them, like governments uh, or, and organisations, entities or businesses and individuals, we should all, all have some form of transparency. So um, organisations are probably your number one. Your government just sets the framework, the guidelines to what you should be doing, and individuals have a play in that. And uh, it's about protecting ind- individuals, the harm, the likelihood of harm to that individual. Um, and I think organisations on in, in a, in a front, they would uh, collect the information, but they're not, very, not all of them are trans- I can't say they as a whole, not all of them. There's some that are, but not all of them are transparent with how they're going to use that information or how they disclose it. And I still think we need to raise the bar a little bit in regards to that transparency. Mm. I think in, in, in Europe, they're doing a great job. I mean, of course, it's, 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 not, the, it's not perfect. We're not, gonna, we're not creating a perfect world. We're not, it's not ideal world. But they do have set the precedent to how we should be working with information and how we should be working with data and what is the repercussions when you breach those those rules the rest of the world i mean america's sort of waking up but in in australia we're very we've got a very lackluster approach to privacy people, people, th- don't, people don't care about privacy right well you know i think we can all agree on that um it, t- it takes me five minutes by the consequences but but, yeah. but the fact of the matter is well, you're not going to be dragged in w- with the odd not mask wear and organizer of of uh, demonstrations by the time when you shouldn't but um basically you don't have the consequences of of you know transgression, so everybody everything works itself out kind mm. of. Mm. That's why we don't have. To yeah, sorry, and, from sorry, a, Brandon, and then from an I individual interrupted your closing statement. Yeah, and an individual from an individual, we've got to be responsible for what we share. Yeah. So um, when you do open source intelligence and you want to hunt down people, well, you don't have to do much because they've already given you all the information already. So um, you can quite easily find out who they are. Mm. Uh, who their friends are, what are they, you can profile them within five minutes um, if you're very lucky or an hour if you're very unlucky mm. um, because they've, they've actually shared that information. Those individuals have shared those information and their friends have actually shared that information and we have all this data um, and all these tools that we could, we've got access to uh, to create an identity of an individual. So we've got that, res- that uh, element of responsibility, the element of responsibility from the organizations to be a lot more transparent with how they share information and how they use it and collect it and store it. And then we've got the element of responsibility from the government side in regards to if you're going to create le- uh, legislation pieces, then, then back it up and say, right, organization, you've actually breached your, you know, the privacy of this, this individual has been harmed in some way, like uh, all those computers and those individuals had to then change the password, cancel the passport and get new ones. No one pays those bills. No one, they, they, those individuals have to cover those costs themselves. And then they, the government should step in and say, right, you got to pay. But then, you know, I do feel sorry for the government. And I do have to say this. I do really feel so. They're sort of like stuck in the hard, uh, hard place in Iraq. Because on one, uh, one side, we're asking them to do this. And the other side said, no, you can't do this. You know, you can't have access to all my finances. But I want you to do all this type of information. So... Um, three-way street for me, responsibility from individuals, organisations and government. And no responsibility by many individuals. That's part of the problem. So the old, uh, uh, you know, trust is good, control is better. I think the transparency of instrumentalities, having bodies that you can rely on to properly check and to mm. properly supervise, and I think raising the level of education with people. Uh, I, I still feel that the biggest problem with privacy at, at, at right now is contractual. Uh, it's the way you enter into the world of digital or any really transaction because you want to get the meal, you want to subscribe to the service. And in that sense, then privacy is taken off you. So forget Mm. government, forget Big Brother. It becomes uh, far more Huxley's brave Mm. uh, modern world in the sense that, you know, we're we're taking the SOMA. Mm. um, And it's not a matter of responsibility. I think it's just everything is a little bit complex right now. And we need to adjust and simplify. Mm. I like that uh, 1984 and a brave new world uh, reference in one. All right, that is Tech Society declares holy war <laughs> on privacy. And I, I, I hope you now care about your privacy. <laughs> <laughs>